I wonder if anybody in the room has ever had some kind of relationship, love, or otherwise go goofy on them or changed or something happened. Eve Lorgan has a book about a very interesting years of research into this little phenomenon and it's called The Love Bite. As most of our speakers, she has a love, uh, she has a website as well, the alien, what well, she'll tell alien you right, Alien Love Bite Connection? AlienLoveBite.com. AlienLoveBite.com. Yes. Did you ever think that if your relationship kind of went sour, <laughs> maybe aliens got in the middle of that someplace? Let's find out. Welcome Eve Lorgan here from Lower California this morning with us at Global Sciences. Okay. <laughs> All righty then. Can you hear me? Okay, well thank you for being here. I really appreciate you coming to listen to my lecture. It probably sounds ridiculous. I know that the title of my book, The Love Bite, Alien Interference and Human Love Relationships. I have a booth up there with many books. Um, it's about what I discovered working with alien abductees and working with people who've had various forms of anomalous trauma. I'm a researcher in the alien abductions area as well as the paranormal, the occult, spiritual warfare, various forms of mind control and what I call anomalous trauma. And the reason why I became interested in this particular field and all the strange things was because I grew up in a family where we had a lot of paranormal activity, UFO sightings and abductions in our family history. So I sought out to learn more about this phenomena and uh, you know read a lot about the early books like by Bud Hopkins and uh, I realized that my life had coincided with many of those cases that he had studied. So I just kept studying and kept studying, uh, talking to people. I was motivated to uh, get involved in as a psychologist, so I got a master's degree in counseling psychology. I had a biochemistry degree before that and worked in biochemistry <coughs> research, but I got bored with it and I wanted to work more closely with people and understand the mysteries that I saw surrounding not only my own life, but other people's lives that wasn't being explained or talked about in the way that I'd like to hear. I wanted to know much more information and I didn't think it was out there in the ways that I think it should be in the published literature or on the lecture circuit. So what I did is I got a degree in counseling psychology. I started working with people who had various forms of trauma, um, other issues as well, family issues, you know, addictions, and I wanted to focus on anomalous trauma, spiritual warfare, mind control, and the alien abduction phenomena. So that's what I did. I started a support group uh, sometimes in the late 80s and early 90s. I started working more closely with people individually and also in a support group. So as a result of my work with working with people in a support group, I noticed that, um, for example here, there, there's a defined syndrome of the alien abduction phenomena that's by many of the mainstream abductions researchers. And you see a lot of this like on some of the television shows like X-Files and some of the movies where you see a classic uh, syndrome of the alien abduction phenomena. And let me go over some of the basic symptoms so that you'll know what I'm talking about because I'm not sure if everybody here is thoroughly familiar with what the alien abduction phenomena is. And there's, there's a, it's a continuum because uh, there's people who are having abductions throughout their family and are part of a multi-generational genetic study. And then there's people who may just have UFO sightings and have an encounter, but they're not part of that syndrome. So I'm really making sure that I'm talking more about the people who are of multi-generational histories. But let me just go over some of the symptoms so you'll know what I'm talking about and, the, and why I wrote the book that I did and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, let's see. Oh, did I get the wrong one here? Of course, UFO sightings is one of the main symptoms here. I don't know if you can hear me. UFO sightings, uh, missing time, usually following a UFO sighting, um, nonsensical screen memories of animals with large black eyes, such as owls, cats, raccoons, deer, many of the above that you see here, um, seeing balls of light, non-human beings, hooded beings in the room at night, that's common, which may communicate to them telepathically, Sometimes when they enter the room, they, you may have an instant paralysis. Uh, frequent dreams of aliens and or abductions. Uh, frequent bloody noses, sinus problems, unexpected needle marks, body marks, bruises, 
uh, scars, pregnancies, gynecological problems, or pregnancies that disappear anomalously. Uh, extreme interest or dislike of the UFO phenomena, sometimes an obsession with it, or sometimes an extreme resistance to it. Uh, and this is what we talked about yesterday. Daryl Sims mentioned the fluorescent spots on the skin that if you have a UV, handheld UV light, and you scan your body, uh, sometimes you can find fluorescent spots after an abduction, which may indicate the handling of the aliens on the skin or maybe a medical procedure that was done that had some kind of fluorescent material. And I did do an article on this that I'll show a little bit more of that later about the fluorescence. It's really fascinating. Um, let's see, flashback memories, dreamlike memories of unaccounted for medical procedures, and sometimes these will happen when you're at the doctor's or dentist office where something's done and all of a sudden you relive, relive like a memory and remember that something happened before but you're not sure where, and these flashback memories will happen sometimes during the day or in dreams, things like that. Uh, unusual phobias of UFOs. Uh, aliens, open stretches of road like in the desert at night, you don't want to drive alone at night. Um, spiders, a big phobia of spiders, uh, large black-eyed animals and lizards and clowns. Uh, sleep disorders is very common. Unexplained health problems uh, like fibromyalgia and, and just waking up extremely exhausted like you've been hit with a truck and you don't know why. A lot of times that's after an abduction. You'll wake up very exhausted even though you, you should have had a full night's sleep. <clears throat> okay, one of the things that's very common that I find fascinating is the psychic ability and frequent paranormal activity. <clears throat> that is a very large part of the phenomena. Um, and then hearing tones, beeps, flutterings in the ears, and sometimes clicks in the ears. Okay, so see, these are some of the basics of what I saw with people who've had alien encounters. Um, but what I noticed more often than not working with people was uh, what I felt was resistance some form of resistance for these people to come forward and share their experiences or go to a therapist or go to a support group or a conference where there was some type of unseen influence in their lives which I felt was mediated by the aliens who abducted them to prevent them from coming to uh, share their experiences or prevent them from coming to the knowledge of the truth of their experiences. And I noticed this more often than not as being one of these key uh, very important issues here that prevented people from sharing useful information in the mainstream and in support groups. And this is, I've noticed more often than not, what I <laughs> thought was like a form of spiritual warfare, blatant spiritual warfare. And also, I noticed the harassment, um, the government, military, strange things, the phone problems, the internet, uh, emails being bounced back, intercepted, uh, all kinds of strange things would happen with these people who've had these experiences. Well, I thought, well, this is really important. Why aren't people really talking about this whole, uh, it appears to be a warfare strategy aimed at not only abductees, but preventing people from coming to the knowledge of the truth and sharing information uh, about the abduction phenomena. And uh, so in the course of that, during my support group, not only did I notice elements of spiritual warfare, but uh, serendipitously actually it happened that about six people in my support group were all ex reporting that they've had these um, terrible obsessive relationships where they believed that the aliens had set them up with a targeted partner and this would happen in their abductions or would be presented to them in a variety of ways which I'll, I will share later and there were obsessive love relationships where they were set up with another partner sometimes it was very painful and it went through a whole scenario and a whole stage which there was re reproducible symptoms and patterns that I noticed that wait a minute here these people, they're having their love lives set up. They're being manipulated and orchestrated by these beings. So what I came to find out was that the alien abduction phenomena is, is rigidly defined by many of the researchers in the field. And what I found out is it's much more involved and goes much deeper than simple medical experiments or implants or missing time or simple scientific or genetic experiments. This goes much beyond the physical realm and enters into the spiritual life and the emotional and psychological life of the abductee. Not only the abductee, but their family members and sometimes the people they work with. And I believe that an element of control and manipulation was exerted in these people's lives and around the people they work with, which was much more extensive than, than I had ever imagined. And it's much more comprehensive than I had ever imagined. And it, it's kind of disturbing, it's kind of scary, because it indicates a level of control and intel intelligence that is beyond our ability to really grasp and understand what's happening. And I think that many people were, were trying very hard to understand it and define it by this rigid nuts and bolts type of uh, mentality. And that, that's just not working. Um, 
because there's so much paranormal, occult, and spiritual activity going on at the same time. It's enmeshed. And I believe that the technologies that they're using on the abductees um, combines you know, a physical technology with real hardware and also an occult spiritual technology that's enmeshed to give a very powerful uh, form of manipulation and control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to some of the symptoms that I found in people who are having what I call love bite setups. And what I define that to be is uh, either a relationship was either set up with this abductee or broken up or manipulated in some way by their alien handlers, abductors. And I'm not so sure that they're all aliens that are actually doing this, that there could be an element of humans interacting in the guise of aliens in some kind of uh, military abduction scenario. About a third or more of the people that I worked with and the case histories in my book, uh, at least a third of them were my lab abductees. What that is, is uh, has been defined as people who've had classic alien abduction encounters with the, the alien greys or the reptilians or the insectoids or various other species in addition to humans that they see in their abduction scenarios, sometimes human military or people in lab coats in underground bases where, you know, let's say one abduction, they just remember aliens and some medical procedure or some mind scan or whatever, and then another series of abductions where they see humans working alongside aliens in an underground base or just the military people or just the lab coat people who are like these medical personnel doing things to them. So I saw this, this is happening all together within one person's experience, and it wasn't just one thing or another, it was something that was enmeshed. So what I like to caution against is black and white thinking, that it's not all aliens and it's not all military, that it, there appears to be a connection between the two. And actually the person who inspired me um, to look more deeply into uh, the phenomena of the human, alien, military, my lab connection and the reptilian factor was the, the, the late Dr. Carla Turner. And now I'm going to get a drink of water. I don't know if any of you remember her. She was an abductions researcher and uh, who was from Texas who had come out in the early 90s with three really good books. And one of the books that she brought out was um, Into the Fringe about her own experiences in her family. Um, she was also an abductee in her family <clears throat> and also a book called uh, Masquerade of Angels. And that one was an excellent expose on the, the ways that her case study was the guy named Ted Rice and he was from Arkansas, one of these southern states. And what she realized by working in conjunction with Barbara Bartholik, who was the hypnotherapist, had discovered that in his encounters, he had many, many screen memories that the aliens wanted him to be a light worker and a channeler and a healer and all this wonderful love and light kind of stuff. And what he discovered is that some of these spirit guides that channeled through him were not spirit guides, but they were the aliens who were abducting him all his life. And many of them were reptilians. And so her book describes and exposes the deception and, and deceit and the manipulation that happened in this guy's life um, within the alien abduction syndrome and how it combined with using him as an asset in some way for an agenda. And that, of course, was you know, disturbing material, shocking for people who wanted to believe that you know, the ETs are here to raise our consciousness and, and they didn't want to hear about reptilians and people didn't want to hear about military abductions and underground bases and lo and behold, this is what she found and she was exposing this. Not only in the case of Ted Rice, but many other people, uh, such as the ones in the book called Taken. And in Dr. Carla's book called Taken, she had about five or six abductees who followed a classic pattern of like the My Lab military abductions. And um, she felt this was significant, and I do too, because I'm seeing some of the same thing. And I wanted to bring this out into the light because this is definitely an important part of the phenomena that appeared to be uh, suppressed. And uh, Dr. Carla Turner did die prematurely of cancer and had a series of anomalous events preceding her getting cancer, and I, I question that because I know it sounds conspiratorial, but if you follow the trail of dead researchers and those who are significantly harassed, you will find significant information that would be useful for you to know. And some of this is disturbing, and I'm not here to tell this to you to, to scare you and make it sound like it's some Hollywood horror story, but it's something that needs to be looked at so that we can uh, have a sense of discernment about what's happening that it's not all love and light, they're not all these benevolent ETs here to raise our consciousness, but there is also a dark element here manipulating people, exploiting, I believe exploiting the human race, especially the abductees, for a particular reason, which I'll go into in more detail in my workshop. 
but I think that the important thing that I would want to get across is the ability to discern, you know, tr truly good from evil and how to discern uh, the evil ones masquerading as angels of light or masquerading as beings of light and how to know what that is so that we can be sure that, you know, we're in a safe place, that we're not being used as assets for some dark force. And I believe that some people have been used and realized that they were being used. And I've spoken to many people who felt like that in the beginning they were learning about their abduction experiences. They wanted to get involved with channeling and channel these space beings and get involved in healing and all this wonderful stuff. Then they realized that the information that some of these space beings were giving them was marginalizing the abduction syndrome, distracting them away from getting to the truth of their experiences and instead of focusing on other things like, you know, positive healing and this and that. And, but it's not that the positive healing stuff was bad in and of itself. It's that these beings were distracting the people from getting to the knowledge of the truth of their experiences and distracting them to go into another direction. And actually, I see that as a form of mind control, and I think that mind control is a very important part of the alien abduction phenomena. Whether or not we want to admit it or not, there is an element of mind control. But before I get too much into that, I want to go into um, some of the basic symptoms that I've found with people who've had what I call love bite relationships. So um, let me go into the next transparency here. It's the one, is it this one? No. Oh, this is the one. Did you just put it in here? Oh, sorry about that. Let's see. Is that backwards? <coughs> yeah. Okay. We may have to... Yeah, well, I'll just read it. There we go. A pointer? Because I just want to make sure you can hear me while I'm doing this at the same time. I can't find it. Spot it for you. Ooh, white on white. But well, see this. Uh, you press it. Uh, mm -hmm. The middle mm -hmm. thing there. I'll tell you what I'll do. I don't know. I'll just read it to you and uh, see where we go from here. <laughs> Actually, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that I found that there was somewhat of a resistance and somewhat spiritual warfare going on within the abductee population when we wanted to find out the truth of their experiences, whether or not it was with a hypnotic regression or coming to share at support group. I felt that there was many factors that went beyond the normal psychological self-sabotage in people who have issues with various things. Um, what I'm saying is that there appeared to be an externally uh, mediated force or intelligence which would direct them away or distract them or prevent them from coming to the support group or um, calling the therapist or whatever. And some of the examples would be before support group time, for example, that their spouse would all of a sudden get in this big fight with them. Um, they had a sudden problem with their car that they couldn't figure out so they couldn't get there. Uh, I remember one couple that was having a love bite relationship came together to one of my support groups and uh, they kept feeling like they shouldn't go, that they shouldn't go, that they'll get in trouble and senses of anxiety about not going. And when, when they came to the house, they did come to the house, they came to the door, and right when they came to the door, before they rang the doorbell, the woman all of a sudden felt like she was going to get sick and pass out and she had this sudden compulsion to just turn around and leave. But she didn't. They, they decided to come and stay. But that's one of the things that will happen. And sometimes you have overt physical symptoms where they'll have, you know, racing heart, chest pains, or pain at the implant site. And it would act as if they were being manipulated and controlled to not go to the support group, not go to their hypnotherapist or whatever, or not meet another researcher or abductee. So what I found is that, you know, working with other people in the field, let's say you're doing working with people who have addictions or uh, various psychological issues and, and you're working with people in a support group environment, you usually don't have that much of a problem for them calling the therapist or coming to support group or having severe uh, inter interference. Working with abductees, there's a lot of interference, there's a lot of resistance, and it takes a lot of effort on a support group facilitator's part to really get them to go and to remind them and call them every now and then, find out how they're doing, and to get them to go to the support group. It takes much more effort in working these, with these people in some kind of therapeutic fashion, I believe. So anyway, what I found that is this is not just a research issue or a therapeutic issue. What I saw here was what appeared to be an overt psyop tactic or warfare tactic aimed 
at prevention of information from coming to the surface in the general population. Therefore, I had to take the strategy, which was not just a researcher or not just a therapist, but someone who's like an intelligence analyst, analyst well-armed in spiritual warfare and various warfare psyops. And so having to work within those means to really get to the truth of the matter and just keep moving forward and keep pressing forward. So it's not easy to do this. It's, and as a matter of fact, it's not easy to get evidence of alien abductions like Daryl Sims has done, getting implants and that kind of thing. I know for a fact that I've run across abductees who said, well, I have an implant and I have this or I have that, and uh, lo and behold, they get abducted or they get manipulated and they lose the implant or something happens and they just can't get it to you and it happens time and time again. It's, it's very difficult to get evidence. And then once you do get evidence, uh, it's hard to get it tested because sometimes the people, they don't want to pay for it. You can't get research funds. They think you're crazy or the people lose their jobs, like one of the uh, scientists that we went to to analyze some uh, material for implants and isotopes, he got fired from his job. And uh, I remember I was working with Daryl at the time to bring the samples to him and he was quite fascinated and came up with this really interesting data and then later on he basically was let go. And it kind of makes you feel guilty that you know you were responsible in some way for someone losing their job, but those kinds of things do happen. So instead of going towards physical evidence in my own work, I realized that, wait a minute, I think one of the most important issues here is what prevents people from getting evidence, which is the warfare conditions which prevent that from coming to light, which is mind control, spiritual warfare, and those kinds of issues. So in the midst of all this, I, I discovered the love bite and how these relationships were being manipulated by sometimes very subtle and insidious forces, but nonetheless, the effects were blatantly apparent and were reproducible and e exhibited a pattern. So what I want to talk about is, is the pattern of what I noticed in a love bite relationship. Okay. Want multiple abduction histories. And this is with people who basically are abduction, abductees who've had multiple abduction histories, although it's not always the case. And I think it depends on the degree of awareness of the individual. And one thing that I would like to say that, that people who are more aware of their encounters have a greater degree of memory, can become lucid in their experiences or in their <coughs> dreams, can recall more information and more useful information um, in this area. Okay, so most people had multiple abduction histories. In most cases, the person had numerous alien encounters and or UFO sightings. In a few cases, the targeted love fight partner did not realize himself or herself to be an abductee. For example, one partner was told by the alien handlers to have been abducted only for the purpose of this particular love bite relationship with a female abductee. <clears throat> so not in all cases are they abductees. Sometimes they're just chosen for that particular thing. <clears throat> okay. Another one is um, if you have memories of bonding scenarios in abductions, vivid dreams, or virtual reality scenarios. The virtual reality scenario is something that Dr. Carla Turner, uh, she basically coined the term in her book called Taken, where many my lab abductees and other abductees would notice that they wouldn't maybe just have a, a physical abduction event, but what they'd notice is that they'd get these very specific type of vivid dreams that were extremely lucid. They were like, they were images being projected in your mind of virtual reality scenarios of particular events, and they felt very real. So in some of these love bite setups, what they'd be presented with is as a virtual reality scenario, which would be maybe a, a flash of the picture of the person that they're supposed to meet later, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, okay, and one of these <coughs> descriptions would be, some have described it as a stage managed dream where both partners are present in a bedroom scene setup where both individuals are being given telepathic messages to initiate contact, either on a verbal level or a more physical sexual level. Oftentimes, either partner appears to be in a tranced or drugged out state. And that's been reported often. And, and it could be that they're perceiving it as a virtual reality scenario because they're in an altered state of consciousness and it very may well be a physical event. Uh, more often than not, that in the abductions, the person is in an altered state of consciousness and their perceptions are seriously altered, which makes it very difficult to remember because Memories are state dependent, so in order to get an accurate memory, you may have to go back in hypnosis or some way to reaccess that state of consciousness to get the memory. And it's usually not your normal waking consciousness. Okay. Um, sometimes these stage managed dreams may have the partners in various situations as if they're being tested for their emotional compatibility or they're coerced into thinking that this person would make an ideal mate. And they have been reported 
that it's like the aliens are watching them for what kind of responses they make to see what would be a perfect partner for them as if they're studying their emotional responses to different stimuli in this virtual reality dream state. Okay, another one of the major things that I've noticed <clears throat> was supernatural events and synchronicities, uncoincidental coincidences and psychic flashes concerning the targeted partner. Meeting the person seems to be set up in a supernatural way, such that the couple may believe their eventual union to be divinely arranged. A match made in heaven. A first meeting of the pre-bonded partner may set off a series of deja vu memories, like flashbacks, um, and, uh, and it may bring back memories of previous abductions or dreams or dream-related bondings. Some have even described it as a, as a body memory of having made love to that person before. Or one or more, one or both partners may have a strong sense of having known each other before as if they knew, knew them all their lives and a very strong soul connection. Another one of the symptoms would be, um, it's kind of connected to this, it's paranormal and supernatural phenomena increases during the love bite drama setup. In other words, sometimes psychic events will happen in an abductee's lives as part of their normal life, but during the love bite drama it increases drastically. This may include empathic and even telepathic uh, communication between the love bite pair, spontaneous remote viewing images and mutually shared dreams. Other oddities may include the physical sensation of the partner's touch or energy field when the other partner is thinking or even fantasizing about them. This is known as telesthesia and is often experienced in a sexual way, um, very often in altered states of consciousness. This condi these conditions may propel either person to find the other, an obsession to find the dream lover. So it sets them off to really find this person if they haven't met them yet. Okay, another one of the factors would be strong emotional, mental, and even psychic connections with the bonded partner, such that it sets up the conditions and desire them for them to meet one another. The connection may be so strong that they have described it as a soul immersion in their beloved or literally having their souls joined to one another. Another byproduct is the amplification of psychic abilities in both or one partner. Some MyLab abductees reported that the reason for the bonding was to amplify their psychic abilities, such as remote viewing, to be later used in secret missions or mind-controlled ops. Okay, another phenomena which um, I noticed, and also I might want to add that Barbara Bartholik is a therapist of about 25 years who's worked in alien abductions, and she actually knew about this love obsession phenomena long before I stumbled across it and I learned much from her and was inspired by Dr. Carla Turner in the case that was in the Ted Rice book Masquerade of Angels and actually I condensed his story and focused on the love bite setup aspect of his story to show the syndrome so that people will be able to look for it. Many people they'll tell their stories and they may not focus on the love bite aspect but very often many abductees have had the relationship set up significantly in their life and sometimes more than one. Okay, so the result of this may be love obsession. A need for one partner or the other to be with them to the point of becoming infatuated and obsessed. This includes the need to meet the person, even if it's in secret, and having to hear the person's voice on the phone, <laughs> sometimes calling the person several times a day, and that has happened <laughs> to almost the point of stalking, at least one case that I worked with. Just hearing the targeted partner's voice may have a calming effect on the obsessed lover. Extreme anxiety may be felt if the obsessed person cannot hear that person's voice or see them somehow. Okay, um, another one. The obsessed partner usually feels love at first sight and may lose all critical reasoning ability. Some have described as having the compulsion to make sudden life decisions like moving away, uh, changing jobs, getting divorced, or going out of their way to do things for the targeted persons. It has been compared to being under a love spell <laughs> wherever the person, the obsessed person hears the partner's voice. They may go to great lengths to please the person, doing anything for them, even giving up their life for them. Okay, and this, this is the part that's really, really gets you, and I know that <laughs> Barbara Bartholek talked about this, and uh, it was unbelievable. I thought that, okay, the aliens are setting people up because they want them to be together, and maybe it's a genetic study, and I'm going to go over some of the reasons why I think they're doing this, but one of the syndromes that kept coming up was this switching off. One of the other partners, one or the other partners becomes unplugged emotionally, leaving the other in a state of unrequited love. Usually the obsessed lover becomes painfully unrequited after the other partner loses interest, often right after an abduction. That's important. 
It has been described as the psychic and emotional unplugging of the targeted partner. Unfortunately, the obsessed lover still feels this strong psychic and emotional connection, but the other switched off partner feels nothing, leaving the obsessed lover grieving and pining away. Or it could be set up in such a way that the conditions for the bonded lovers are such that it's impossible for them to consummate their strong love such that both partners are being married to one another or they live a great distance away. So what I saw was in a degree of emotional tension that was, that was heightened during this, this process. <clears throat> and what resulted, of course, was emotional turmoil and unrequited love, at least in one of the partners' life, or both of them, actually, there was emotional trauma going on. These powerful emotions of love and grief may cause the person to be inspired with creative energy so that they write poetry, music, or some art form or creative inspiration. But conversely, also the degree of emotional pain may throw the person into suicidal tendencies and mental and physical exhaustion or illness. And in one of the cases in my book, um, that, that happened where the, the woman became extremely ill, but also at the same time became uh, creative and inspired and wrote all this uh, poetry and, and artwork and had profound mystical experiences. So there's, there's something going on that propels the person to almost reach a threshold of their ability to handle the nth degree of their emotional capacity. And it's almost as if they're being tested that way. Okay, so profound mystical experiences is one thing that, that was found, where um, in one case it was a transcendent case, but that's actually a rare event. I think that, um, I know that Dr. Mack talks a lot about uh, the transformative aspect of being in, in abductions and transforming from your experiences, but more often than not, I, I don't believe that's taking place. I think it takes much, much more um, soul searching and psychological therapeutic work to really get to, to a state of transcendence and um, dealing with your issues. I think that many people are, are mind controlled into believing that the aliens are here to help us or guide us and that, that may not be the case. I think that we should definitely challenge what they're doing. And when you do challenge them, then you'll find out why when you get all this resistance and warfare. Okay, uh, another aspect was increase in alien encounters during periods of high drama and emotional conflict. The alien encounters may also increase if the person gets involved in alternative sexual lifestyles or increased sexual activity, especially if it's with the targeted love by partner. Uh, one of the people who's in uh, the book, she had a, a lot of reptilian encounters, and I think that they were using her for more reason than one, but it did increase her sexual drive and as if that was increasing her kundalini, trying to activate her kundalini energy as well. Um, and one of the things that we noticed that I may go into in the workshop in more detail is um, the phenomenon of the reptilians, shape-shifting reptilians, and the hosting process, where there was a certain element, a darker element, involved in connections with reptilians where people, let's say, ex well, drug abusers are using a lot of crack and methamphetamines into the darker elements, um, you know, a lot of sexual perversions or whatever, that they had a higher degree of reptilian encounters, reptilian sexual activity and um, abductions. And that's something that Barbara Bartholek has been working with closely and noticing. Okay, some abductees have reported the bonding experience to take place more than once, whereby they have been on both sides of the love bite. Let's say they were obsessed with one particular setup and then another setup, they weren't really obsessed, but the other person was with them. And they may be set up a series of times. So it's uh, not just one time thing. Um, other things that may happen is that some heterosexuals have been suddenly obsessed with a homosexual where a drastic lifestyle or sexual alternate lifestyle ensues. And I, again, I think it's because the aliens are trying to test them for um, their behavior and their emotional capacity and their sexual orientation. It seems to be a large part of what they're interested in. And it, you know, unfortunately, this is a very, very embarrassing thing to talk about. I found that many researchers, they may have found this in private, but they certainly didn't want to talk about it. And more often than not, sometimes it happened to the researcher and they, they didn't want to talk about it. And so this is, a, this is a taboo area that many people really don't want to talk about because it uh, has been reported on the internet recently, ufology's dirty little secret. And um, it does happen, and I found it happens to at least about a third of the abductees that I was working with. And I suspect that it's going on much more it's just that they're not aware, and that once we become aware of the symptoms and what to look out for and to enhance our degree of awareness, then we're going to start noticing how the veil comes off our eyes and how this whole thing is really working together. It's not just physical abductions. 
And of course, there, you know, there are variations to the love bite dramas, um, where, for example, two abductees are placed together perhaps for the purpose of having children, and they may not go through the whole stage of the whole love bite setup with the switching off and, and everything that I just described. Um, and based on the number of love bite histories I've compiled, I've come to the conclusion that there are about four reasons for these setups. And at first I thought it was just, oh, well maybe they're just doing it for genetic bloodline studies. They wanted to set people up because they wanted to, you know, have those kids of those particular genetic qualities and then they abduct the kids. Because more often than not, um, they'll, they'll take the kids of the abductee and they continue on the process. But in many of the love bite setups, um, the person, the couples didn't have children together, although sometimes one believed that they became pregnant and um, that pregnancy was taken, or they became pregnant with the target love bite person and not their spouse, ended up having the child, and the child may really be the child of the love bite setup who's not the spouse of the abductee, and those kind of things have happened. Okay, so that's one factor. The reason would be, of course, the genetic bloodline study. That's the most logical thing if they have children. Very often they didn't have children. I thought, well, why would they be setting people up in these relationships? They're not having kids, so it's not because of the, the bloodline thing. So uh, what Barbara Bartholek and I also believe is that there's a strong emotional harvesting or a type of emotional soul harvesting of energies siphoned off the abductee for aliens such as the reptilians. I think you notice that more with the reptilians than some of these other aliens. It's more manifest. The degree of emotional conflict and chaos is more manifest in the people who are having reptilian uh, abductions. Dracos are demonic powers accrued to human magicians. Sometimes I believe it may be a way of accruing human soul energy, cosmic energy, creative energy from creating these, these circumstances which raise the degree of emotional conflict and tension. Uh, in cases where sep sexual manipulations are done, these sexual energy can be used in Montauk type experiments for time travel or psi amplifications or materializations. <coughs> and that's a theory. Okay, one of the things that I noticed too that may be one of the reasons for a love bite setup would be the amplification of paranormal abilities such as telekinesis, telepathy, remote viewing, and precognition through sexual and soul bonding of their other psychic abductees. In this case, you can call them my lab operatives. Um, what I see happening is they're not just medical experience, experiments for aliens, but what I also saw was the concept that some of these people may be used as assets or operatives for some intelligence agency that is combined with the aliens in some way, where they are highly trained to do a specific function or a variety of functions. And one of those functions is to have a very high degree of psychic ability. And one of the ways to amplify those psychic abilities is through a variety of sexual bonding, soul bonding with other people so that the kundalini is raised or you have a soul immersion effect with a targeted partner who may be more psychic or equally psychic and then it just drives up the psychic abilities. And I, I'll discuss that at more length in the workshop with specific cases where that kind of thing was done in conjunction with reptilian aliens and, and some human military element. Okay. So the amplification of the psychic abilities. Uh, some of these operatives may have monarch programming or the more sophisticated alien programming based on the fundamentals of monarch MK Ultra programming. And I think that that's something that's very important that as an abduction researcher and people in the UFO field, we need to understand what MK Ultra is, the various forms of mind control, um, dissociation and splitting and how that's done so that we can make an assessment if that's happening because what I see is that there's a basic ignorance of how that happens and how to assess for it within the alien abduction research field and they may not be getting the whole picture. Okay, oftentimes programmers who orchestrate the various missions for their highly trained operatives will want to soul bond and sexually bond a pair. This serves to keep the twinned operatives loyal to one another and increase their performance. For example, when two operatives are so bonded to one another, they can telepathically transmit large amounts of information to one another, sometimes during sexual activity. If they love one another, they will also die for one another because they really care for each other, taking greater risk for the success of a dangerous mission. Okay, and one of the last uh, reasons why I think love bites are done, and this could be setups or breakups of relationships or manipulations thereof. And this is one thing that I found was significant and was happening uh, to researchers and abductees. Distraction and neutralization of troublesome abductees or researchers who are either breaking programming, whistleblowing, or getting too close to the truth. Um, 
I think that Dr. Carla Turner got very, very close to the truth of what she found. And uh, I know that other researchers have experienced this kind of thing. They kept it to themselves. They really didn't want to say too much about it. But I've received several emails and testimonies from people since the publication of my book. That's exactly what happened to them. And now they're really wondering, what the hell's going on? OK, this may present itself as an abductee client that comes to work with a researcher where a love affair ensues. Then the relationship may be an emo emotional roller coaster or create chaos in the researcher's life, distracting him or her from useful research. Or another condition would be a sleeper operative abductee starts coming to a support group, wreaking chaos wherever they go, which may include a love bite setup with one of the members of the support group. It may result in dividing the support group, creating unnecessary enmity between abductees and researchers who could have shared insightful experiences. In these instances, the setup serves to prevent useful information from reaching the public. And as a matter of fact, I put a case history in my book of a, I think what I call is a typical example of how support groups are, like let's say a, a sleeper operative is sent in, the person may be an abductee or someone who's had some kind of MK Ultra programming, they go into the support group, they may offer, oh, channeled readings or psychic readings, and they come to the support group to shed this love and light theory, and it comes at just this opportune moment when um, serious information is being shared about what someone found in their hypnotic regression about the screen memories and the reptilian encounters and underground base information or whatever it was and that person comes at just the right moment when those things are being shared to distract the group and then uh, in one of my cases one of these operatives was like a MPD who was doing all these psychic readings and she you know raided the telephone list of the, of the support group facilitator called all the people and basically tried to pull them away from the support group leader distracting you know the the content of what was going on in the support group process and that's something to watch out for because the distractions happen continuously and I've seen that myself in general there's great resistance amongst the UFO abductee population to discuss the more negative alien abduction reports I can personally attest to this when being on various internet list groups or support groups uh, held by the less informed group facilitators. And it actually it takes trial and error to really get through this stuff to notice how these things are being set in place to distract people from just getting to the truth of their experiences. There's definite warfare going on. Um, and the resistance, of course, is usually regard, regarding reptilian aliens, mind control, sexual assaults, underground, underground base memories, military element, and some of the more negativistic things. And it's not that good ET encounters aren't happening. I think that they are, but they're rare. And the majority of the people that are abductees are probably falling into under the group of aliens that are exploiting them for some reason. And I think they're being exploited for some genetic quality that they have. And some of those genetic qualities, I wondered, you know, what is that? So I put together a series of symptoms and characteristics of abductees that I'm going to share in the workshop about, you know, what could be this specific bloodline study and the characteristics and the genes that they're really looking for and exploiting in a subset of the population. Because it's certainly not happening to all people or all abductees, but there are a subset of people that have very unique capabilities that I think that they're exploiting in some way. What I want to do is I want to just show you some of the, the transparencies I have before my time is up just to show you a flavor of the different kind of aliens that people are reporting seeing and just some of, the, some of the work that I've done. I have a lot more to share in the workshop and a lot more detail to go into also. <clears throat> okay, classic gray alien. I'm sure everybody's seen one of those. In pictures, that is. Maybe not in your own life or experience, but that's the, the usual ones that are reported in the abduction syndrome. <laughs> this is a cute one. Uh, this one, I, I had one of my people in the support group who's an artist, and he's done sketches for us. And one of the women in the support group whose case history is in my book has seen a number of um, aliens, some of them reptilian. And some of these reptilians, there's various forms. The ones that she's seen, we call them the baby Godzillas. We, we had to define our own, our own words, our own definitions because of the things that we're seeing. And these ones were about, what, two and a half, three feet tall. Uh, maybe their heads are not as fat as that, but um, they actually they came to her, this woman after she was contacted by a researcher in mind control who wanted to investigate her case, and you know thought that oh well it's all mind control I'm all you know all military da 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 da, and then the next day these beings come in the daylight when her kids were home came and visited her and used this this wand thing to uh, 
what do you call it, levitator up to the ceiling in, in full view of her three kids. And it was almost as if it was a joke to say, ha, 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 we're real. This is not mind control. Look at what we can do. And that's what she reported happening. And um, these things have been reported in a high desert area of California and other areas, probably in Nevada also. <coughs> That's another baby Godzilla type. It's actually a, um, a teenager, a boy who, who see this, who drew this, and he's a San Diego resident who's seen one of these baby Godzilla types. And sometimes they wear like capes or exotic looking types of clothing. It's strange. <laughs> this is a funny one. <laughs> this is really cute looking here. One of the people in my group, uh, has had many encounters, not only with reptilians, but other aliens. And he notices an unusual phenomenon that's been reported by a few people. And it's, he saw an interdimensional portal like open up in his bedroom and these reptilians peeking out at him. And one of the things that I'll share more in the support group is, is exactly how these things happen. Like when you have a bedroom encounter, it's not just a craft coming and throwing in a beam and taking you through the wall or whatever. Sometimes they report an interdimensional portal literally opening up in their room and they go through this portal physically and then they're gone and they go somewhere else. So that was one of these interdimensional deals. <laughs> Okay, and they see classic gray aliens. A lot of times they wear these uh, robes and hoods. These are the robed ones. And this is just a demonstration of how they would be, you know, setting up two targeted partners to have sex and have some kind of connection and observing the activity and putting the telepathic messages in their mind. It's just demonstrating what they were doing. Oh, I want to trip on that. I'm just trying not to. Okay, here's another one, um, the dark-robed ones. There's also dark-robed alien grays. Sometimes they wear these medallions. That's what some people have reported. Um, this is just to demonstrate you know, how they'd come to her bedside at night and um, telepathically speak to her or whatever. Okay, and one of our people tried to do a sketch of a reptilian. Actually, it's almost a reptilian-human hybrid uh, that he thought. And um, that's what it looked like. They have the slit eyes, kind of the snaky looking eyes, scales. Sometimes they have a tail and they have claws. Sometimes it's a four claws, claws on their toes. Um, sometimes they're brown, green. Sometimes they have a yellow belly. There's different kinds of reptilians being reported. <coughs> and this is another kind of being that somebody reported. It appeared to have a type of mask or helmet that it looked like a, a warrior, a reptilian warrior uh, alien. Okay, and these are just some of the different kinds of beings that this person had seen. You see the classic gray, the small ones, uh, the blue gray. Actually, I've seen one of the blue grays before in my experience, and they're a little more spindly. Um, the reptilian Draco, sometimes they have wings, um, the snake-like eyes. Um, they're very tall, usually about seven feet tall, very heavy. Sometimes they wear a breastplate and have warrior type of look to them. Sometimes they wear robes with jewels on them that look like ancient Egyptian gods sometimes. And um, then the other ones, the cloaked ones that are, I think they're dark black or blue with big lips and they have the hoods. I know that Whitley Strieber had reported this type of being also. They're, they're short and they're small. Oh, the one over here, um, this is an interesting one. I've talked to about five people who've seen this type of being. It's like an interdimensional being and we, we just called them, we just made up a name for them because they look kind of like vampires or the Voodooka people, we call them. They wear, sometimes they wear robes and medallions and have spiky hair and they look they're pretty evil looking with very high cheekbones, very gaunt cheeks. Um, and I met a person, actually another abductee who had seen these beings where these elder good guy ETs were showing her how to do spiritual warfare against some of these demonic type of creatures. And it's very interesting because my son has seen some of the same kinds of beings and so they're, they're a type of interdimensional being. And then the other one is kind of like a Nordic, a female Nordic that, that they've seen, just a typical human looking person. And there's many varieties of beings that people see, like the praying mantis types and the Wookiee types. I mean, there's many different kinds of beings that are seen. So they're not just one kind of alien. And uh, how much more do I got there? Okay, oh, this is just to demonstrate uh, how in some of the cases, 
Um, the aliens, it's as if they were injected imagery into the abductee's mind. They would get spontaneous remote viewing images in their mind of various things. Sometimes it's, you know, apocalyptic disasters or whatever, but in the love bite thing, Actually, what happened is they showed the abductee a scenario of his ex-girlfriend who was like a love bite setup who he was in love with, you know, having sex with someone else and incited him to feelings of rage and jealousy. And it was as if the aliens were trying to uh, elicit these kinds of emotional responses by injecting this imagery in his mind. Okay. And this is the Voodica being that was seen by many of the people in my group. And um, they're more like an interdimensional being. And they're, they're kind of tall. And I think, <clears throat> let's see, I could just show you what I'm going to talk about. Well, I don't have much time left. Um, you can go ahead and show that. Yeah. Is that. And this is just a list of the different symptoms that I collected together. I, I collated data on about 22 abductees and tried to do a series of stats on things that I felt were significant and important based on symptoms reported by abductees that may be different from people in the regular population. I'll go over that in more detail in the workshop just to show you that there are symptoms, there are things that I think may be genetic factors, things that are psychological factors that could be of key importance. One of the things that I thought was important that I just picked off the bat was the incidence of near-death experiences in these people's lives was much more than the average of people who've experienced near-death experiences and it's a neither genetic or after effect of abductions. <laughs> it just happened to be something that I thought was significant. So I'm going to go over that in more detail. Um, you're just going to have to ask questions in the uh, workshop because I don't know if I have time now. Um, <clears throat> some people think they were matched together by divine forces and it didn't have anything to do with alien manipulation. Uh, that could be, and it could be a past life connection that some people believe they have. But um, you know, if you're an abductee with a multiple abduction histories and you sense manipulation, it could be that you're being manipulated or set up in some way. And it's, it's important to assess for that so you don't blindly believe anything that your spirit guides or aliens or whatever are telling you. Um, and last but not least, I think that um, true love will not try to control and manipulate. True love will support freedom from the bonds of ignorance and encourage individual sovereignty. It will also expose the darkness and not sweep it under the rug. Uh, true love will empower the individual and work in unselfish ways to promote freedom for others. Most importantly, true love is discerning, confident, unselfish, humble, persevering, and deeply compassionate for the suffering of others. The greater our awareness of what, we, of what is truly happening in today's sophisticated world, the better we are able to regain control over our destinies. At first, we will become disturbed. But if our true love, or if our love for the truth, outweighs our arrogance and ignorance, then we can have a chance for true love and freedom. And so I'd just like to close with that, that true love is much more discerning, and exposing the darkness is not a bad thing and is not negative, that we need to have discernment. And that's one thing that I want to bring out more than anything else. Let's discern, let's assess for some of these other things before assuming that it's some benevolent ET here to guide us into some spiritual utopia. And that's it.